with Maura Murray, you have this sister, daughter, loved one, friend who disappears and there's no reasonable, simple explanation for it. When Mara walked into a room, you knew she was there. Her smile lit up the room. She was very thoughtful and caring and concerned about others. Maura Murray, a 21-year-old nursing student from New England, went missing 16 years ago. Since her disappearance, her story has become one of the most well-known unsolved mysteries in the social media age. She was a standout student athlete. She scored almost a perfect score on her SATs and math. Um, so she was, she was heavily recruited by multiple different colleges and universities coming out of high school. She really did well in track. She actually finished 33rd in the entire country in the two mile. For me, Mara is just my little sister. Like, she's who I grew up with. We did regular things, and we miss her. On February 9th, 2004, Mora sent an email to her professors at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Maura Murray sends an email that says she's going home because there's been a death in the family. It turns out that's not true. According to investigators, she made a call to a condo in New Hampshire, packed a bag of necessities, and left her school's campus at about 4.30 p.m. Later, she goes to an ATM. She withdraws most of her money. Then she goes to the liquor store and she makes a number of purchases. And then she just goes on a drive, heading hours up to Haverhill, New Hampshire. Mike Bodet, an Emmy Award-winning investigative reporter at Boston news station WCBB, has covered Moore's story in the years since her disappearance. We end up finding out after the fact that there have been a few incidents leading up to when she disappeared. Among them, she had been in her father's car in the days leading up to this and had actually crashed her father's car. And so that obviously distressed her to some degree. Investigators also discovered that she had actually used MapQuest to map out a path to Burlington, Vermont. Shortly before 7.30 p.m. that evening, Mora was involved in a single car crash on Route 112 near Haverhill, a road that her family says she knew well. It's a road to Bartlett, where I'm sure she was going, because she knows it uh, like, like, like her backyard because we were in New Hampshire so much, at least four times a year. She was, she was up there every year of her life. Two witnesses called 911 to report the accident. The first at 7.27 p.m., followed by another 15 minutes later. The second witness, a bus driver named Butch Atwood, is the last known person to speak to Mora before she disappeared. I just asked her how she was. She said she was shaken up. I couldn't see any blood on her face. And she was... Uh, shaking like this, I says, uh, okay, I'm going to go call the police. He asked her if she needed help, and she declined, stating that she had already called AAA, which Butch knew at the time could not be possible because there's no cell phone service in that area. So there's that small period of when Butch left Mara and went back to his house to call 911. And in that small window of time, with multiple neighbors watching, Mara disappeared off the face of the planet. It's a unique case because of the, the short window when she disappears. She's literally she's seen by people and she's gone. The police get there within around 10 minutes. They find her car, it was a minor crash, but the car isn't drivable, the car is locked up. They go inside, they find alcohol. They think she actually took a backpack with her, but she left other belongings that were in the car. There were textbooks, there was a few changes of clothes, her running shoes. She took some of the alcohol that she had purchased that day at UMass with her, so it was not recovered in the vehicle. And it was a pretty fair amount of alcohol. So, you know, I try to think of, did she run down the road? Maybe. Uh, but she did have bottles of alcohol in her backpack, so that would have made that a little bit difficult. Moore's family was told of her disappearance the following day. Basically, it was like a family alert roster was activated and everyone's calling everyone and trying to figure out what is going on. Um, and I, I just remember complete confusion at first um, when I got the call. And they just asked, where's Mara? And I was like, what do you mean? Where's Mara? She's at school. And then they said, no, she was in an accident in New Hampshire. And then we're trying to figure out why is she in New Hampshire on a Monday night. So then it quickly went into chaos and panic. 
Haverhill Police, State Police, and Morris family searched the surrounding area in the months that followed for any sign of her. We did an intensive search of the crash scene area for evidence that she may have walked into the woods. Um, nothing like that was uncovered. Her family often drove more than 150 miles from their hometown of Hanson, Massachusetts to look for her. We've been going through the woods, all her favorite spots, and we're just, just looking for something. Somebody just to come out and say something. Everybody's here looking for you. Just call any one of us and we'll come right down and get you. Don't be afraid, please. Her boyfriend even flew in from Oklahoma to help with the search. We're all sticking together and we're all giving each other a hand. We love her and we want her back. Moore's family placed missing posters and flyers in and around Haverhill, as well as into Vermont. A $40,000 reward was offered for tips that could lead to a break in the case. We're also asking the public who may have driven by the scene of the accident that night to please give us a call if someone saw her and gave her a ride because it would give us a better last known area where she was. If anybody actually saw her on uh, the road that night, did not see her, drove the whole road, did not see her, call us because now we know that she did not go down there and she uh, most likely accepted a ride and you know we're considering other locations. There have been so many theories about what happened to Maura Murray and no one can absolutely point to one specific thing. Was she trying to get away from her life at UMass? But was it just going to clear her head or was it going to disappear and start a new life? People have speculated that maybe she committed suicide. Maybe she walked off into the woods and just died from the elements. The family believes that someone killed her. We suspected foul play very early on. There's several different things that kind of make us believe that. And one is the scent dog that was on the scene, lost her scent right up the road, which would indicate she got into a vehicle. No activity on her cell phone or a bank. If she did walk into the woods, which is one of the theories, we would think that something would have been found, her keys, her cell phone, um, backpack, something. She never reached out to anybody in the family all these years. Um, and one thing people tend to overlook is the fact that my mother passed away from cancer. She would never let my mom pass away without reaching out if she was able to. With her whereabouts still unknown one year later, family and friends hosted a gathering marking the anniversary of her disappearance. They decorated a tree with a large blue ribbon near where she was last seen, a tradition that the Murray family holds up to this day. My father actually said, we got to do something to mark this location, as it is the last location that she was seen alive. Every year he puts a new blue ribbon. And so that's all that there is there. There's just this blue ribbon that just sits on the tree and it's been there for the entire time, 16 years. And it's kind of the, the rally point for when we have annual vigils or when we have searches, or even if I'm up in the area doing something related to the case, you know, I always drive by and, you know, I just, feel certain energy in that area. Frustrated by the lack of progress in the case, in 2005, Fred Murray filed a petition with New Hampshire Superior Court, claiming that the state police department's refusal to release investigative files pertaining to Moore's case, approximately 2,500 documents, was illegal. My dad felt that if they weren't going to investigate, he wanted to investigate because, you know, this is his missing baby girl. And it was at the Superior Court where he asked for some of the records to be released. They declined it. So then my dad challenged that and then it got moved up to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. This is just part of you know, overturning the, uh, the next stone to see what's under it. And, but it's incredibly hard and uh, it's, it's terribly frustrating. In 2006, the court ruled in favor of the police department. The state said that because Moore's case was still classified as a missing persons investigation, the release of information pertaining to her case could jeopardize any potential future prosecution. And while they do release some information to him, what they release is mostly redacted. And the bulk of the information they won't release because it's still under this active investigation. Shouldn't the state at the very least concede that it's a criminal investigation? I gather the state hasn't even done that. We cannot for, with 100% certainty, say that a crime has been committed. I think the fear of the authorities is that if they put all this information out there, it's just going to 
get tangled up and add to some of these false narratives that are out there. So I think it's this tension between the family and the authorities. If you keep it a missing person case forever, you never have to say anything at all about what you did. We want to be sure that when we find out what happened to Maura Murray, that if it involved a crime, that we can bring that person to justice. But what's so frustrating about that 16 years later is what happened to that chance of law enforcement proceedings? Absolutely nothing. Despite the unfavorable ruling, Maura's family never stopped looking for her. We have people from all over the country, all over the world, that follow and are invested in this case. We have people that come up on an annual basis to Haverhill. We have people that have donated to a GoFundMe page. We have so many different podcasts. I think every major true crime podcast is covering Mara Murray. She's in the news all the time. And I'm just thrilled because it helps to keep her story alive. So the continued coverage, I think, is eventually what's going to solve this case. It's one of those cases, especially because it's unsolved, that we keep coming back to, whether it's the five-year anniversary, the 10 year anniversary, the 15 year anniversary, or whether there's some new development in the case. In February 2019, Fred Murray hired two cadaver sniffing dogs to search the basement of a home in Woodsville, New Hampshire, near Morris crash site. There's your positive right there. The dog lays down. Yes. We had two independent respected cadaver dogs that alerted in the basement in essentially the same spot at two different times, two different handlers. So when these type of things happen, you kind of like, your heart starts beating faster and you're like, oh my God, could this, could this be it? So we had a ground penetrating radar team come in. They did a scan of the basement and they found an anomaly underneath the surface where the cement was. It tells me that my daughter is buried there most likely and that I'm powerless to dig her up and bring her home and give her a proper burial. Investigators finally agreed to excavate the location in April, 2019. There's always a level of uncertainty with something like this. I am optimistic that we may have finally found her. That's the only thing I could pray for. It was only about four hours after the dig started. I got a call from the victim advocate and said, hey, we're going to have a press conference. And I'm freaking out and sweating. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, wow, they must have found her because who has a press conference for, you know, nothing. But as Moore's family anxiously waited for clues or closure, the results of the investigation turned out to be the opposite of what they wanted to hear. A team of over a dozen uh, agents and detectives went into that basement, they cut that area, removed the concrete, and then searched several feet down and covered the entire area and beyond where that disturbed ground uh, had been. And they located absolutely nothing other than a small piece of what looks to be uh, potentially uh, pottery, or maybe a piece of old piping. So that whole press conference was frustrating. I'm glad that they did the dig, but I wish we would have gotten closure there, but also at the same time, I'm glad she's not buried in the basement. This one hurts because I thought we finally had it. This one is worse than the other false alarms or dead ends. Clearly it was devastating for Fred. You felt for him because he still wasn't convinced, but you know they dug there, they did what he asked, and they did not find her remains. But her family still has not given up hope. They are constantly looking for new ways to bring the case back into the public eye, especially on the internet. The website maramarimissing.org was launched on Mara's 38th birthday. We have this powerful, powerful community that really wants to find out what happened. But the problem is when you've got all these different places to discuss Mars' case online, a lot of times the information that is just said several times now becomes fact. So I wanted to create a family-run website with accurate information and a way for people that are following the case to get the latest news. And I just want people to know how grateful we are for their support. I always tell people that somebody knows something. And what I mean by that is just keep talking about Mara because there's a missing piece out there. We're just trying to pull out all stops and find her. I'll quote my dad and what he said one time at a vigil up at the ribbon tree, and that is, we are coming for you, kid. With this support that we have in this community and my personal vow is I'm never stopping and this is never going away.
If you want to learn more about Morris Case, submit tips and questions to the Murray family directly or support the Blue Ribbon campaign, you can visit their official website, www.moramurraymissing.org. I'm Aaron Burrell. Thanks for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel, Stitch, for new episodes of Dispatches from the Middle.